So, uh, welcome to the uh, third uh, presentation in this uh, educational session. It's on developing analog circuit generators using the Berkeley Analog Generator Framework, or BAG. Uh, it will be co-presented by Professor um, Elad Alon and his PhD student, Eric Chang, who will be doing demonstrations across the web. So, uh, Professor Alan is a co-founder and chief scientist of Blue Cheetah Analog Design. Blue Cheetah was founded in late 2018 by a team of Berkeley students and faculty and aims to commercialise the generated technologies originally developed at UC Berkeley, where Professor Alan is always already a professor, in order to provide analog mixed signal design solutions at a lower barrier entry. Uh, and also, um, this is Professor Al Alon is one of the uh, inductees as a new IEEE fellow this year, so it's an honour for him. Uh, his student, Eric Chang, received the BS degree in E in Computer Science from UC Berkeley in 2011. Uh, from then until 2014, he was a full-time researcher at Oracle Labs, where he worked on oscilloscopics. Um, and uh, he's just about to graduate with a PhD under, guess who, uh, coming this year, so I'll pass it on to you. Great. Thank you very much for the introduction. So it's a pleasure to be here. Um, just to clarify a little bit, you know, sort of, I, I, I'm wearing multiple hats these days, so the hat I'm going to be specifically wearing for this presentation is kind of the company side, uh, so that's why you'll be seeing the company logo on here. Uh, Eric also is actually full-time at the company, uh, you know, as, as was mentioned, he's like literally in the process of writing the thesis and I need to like sign it so that he's officially graduated, uh, but actually both of us are essentially hanging out full-time at the company these days. So as Colin said, what I'm going to be presenting today is some of the work we've done with, you know, the Berkeley Analog Generator, uh, which indeed the intention here is to make this a process portable framework to allow us to actually do these so-called generator-based AMS circuit designs. If, you know, what in the world I mean by a generator-based design, you know, makes absolutely no sense to you, don't worry, I will try and clarify that as we go through the talk. And in fact, you know, at some point I'll say if there's one thing you learn from all this, like here, this is where you pay attention, it'll really be what we mean by actually writing these generators. So I don't think I need to spend a lot of time on this particular slide because I think, you know, given the name of the session and all the folks who are here, you probably know this very well. But nonetheless, just to make sure we're all on the same page, you know, SOC design has become a very, very expensive proposition these days. Um, and it's become such that, you know, unless you're actually building the absolute highest volume products that are out there, NRE costs pretty much just completely dominate, okay? Um, and you can kind of think about this in that, you know, if you're selling, you know, your chips for like $5 a pop or so, if you spend about $300 million designing the chip in the first place, that means you need to sell 60 million units just to even have like manufacturing cost equal the design cost, right? let alone actually be dominant. So this is really kind of telling you why it is the case that indeed just design cost is kind of the key issue that many people are paying a lot of attention to today. Um, and I should mention that this is true even if you actually do have these very high volumes because at the end of the day, you know, the, the, if you reduce the design costs, it's A, better time to market, which probably is going to be a win in and of itself, and B, obviously that improves your margins as well. Now, not to say that analog mixed signal design is the primary cause of the high design costs. It's really actually kind of across the board. Um, but nonetheless, analog mixed signal design is certainly becoming one of the key bottlenecks. Um, and the other thing to, to sort of, let's say, highlight why this is a, you know, a continuing issue today is that I think most of us will agree if we just sort of take a step back and watch how it is that people have been going about doing the designs of the last 30 years or so, I'm going to argue that things really haven't changed all that much. Now, this is not to say that the tools have not gotten better. Absolutely, they have. This is not to say that designers have not gotten better. Absolutely, they have. But nonetheless, kind of the basic process we go through really has not shifted. And obviously, I'm abstracting things very, very heavily here. But to zero order, I would argue that, you know, again, if you just sort of watch what analog based digital designers do, it's almost always, you know, you start with some specifications, you go and you draw some initial schematic, you know, you go, you write some equations or you run some other preliminary simulations to come up with a sizing for that schematic. Um, you know, once you've sort of simulated and said, okay, yeah, I think this is a reasonable sort of first stab at things, oftentimes you'll hand that schematic over the wall to someone who actually does the layout. The layout person will go off and do what it is what they do. And inevitably, and especially for you know, these modern processes, which I think you've heard a lot about from Alvin already, you know, the thing will come back and just be completely and totally broken. Right? And this is where you start the iterative loop of saying, okay, well, fine, it didn't really work the first time. Let me try and resize some things, re-simulate, try and take into account some of the layout parasitics, and then essentially just loop through that procedure as many times as is necessary 
And oftentimes, as many times, you know, before you just sort of say, all right, this is too painful, I'm done. So as I've already been hinting at here, uh, you know, the layout part of it is really quickly becoming kind of the key bottleneck, right? You know, coming up with a set of design equations or even just preliminary sizing oftentimes in the beginning is a fairly straightforward thing to do. It's really kind of getting all the way through that layout that becomes the very big problem. And again, I think you heard a lot about this from Alvin already. Uh, if you didn't hear it today, you might have heard it you know, last year when Alvin gave a very similar talk here at this conference. And the issue is really kind of twofold. One is the DRC rules themselves are becoming more and more painful, right? The, the size of the design rule manual is kind of, you know, this monotonically increasing thing over time. But besides the fact that it's becoming very difficult to actually pass the DRC rules, again, unless you sort of take some other quote unquote extraordinary measures, the, the actual interactions you have between the layout and your real performance are also becoming more and more you know, essentially direct and difficult to deal with. Right, so the interconnect parasitics themselves are becoming increasingly dominant. And on top of that, there's all these complex layout effects, you know, stress and you know, local variance of, of densities and things of this nature, that basically you, know, you can really get very, very different results coming back from any initial layout you did. And this just caused you to have to iterate through many more times to actually get to the solution you're interested in. So one of the answers obviously is, okay, fine, let's just try and go and automate the layout if this is kind of where the bottleneck really stands. And obviously this is exactly the direction that you know, all the modern digital designs have gone. And indeed, there's been a lot of investment exactly in the area of specifically analog layout automation. Um, and and you know, I'd say that there's kind of varying degrees of this. Uh, so you could look at, for example, the Cadence Modgens, the Synopsys Custom Compilers. Uh, there's also been sort of more academic work on, for example, just rule-based types of approaches where you're trying to use sort of the existing digital place and route flows, but constraining them to actually get back the layouts you're interested in. And don't get me wrong, all of these I think are very interesting and have shown reasonably interesting results. But I don't think I have to sort of, you know, convince any of you too much to say that, unfortunately, most of these techniques just really aren't used today. Okay, now, some of this has to do with, let's say, human behavior, and I'll get into this more in a moment. But the point here is really that if you look sort of carefully at analog layout, there's a lot of ways to do it basically wrong and only a few ways to really do it right. Okay, so I'm just give you a couple of very simple examples here. Um, and this is something that, you know, for me as an academic, you know, teaching students, these are like the kind of examples I see happening, you know, like almost immediately off of the bat. All right, so let's say I go, I tell a student, all right, please go and build like some current DAC array or something like this. And so they do, they, you know, they build the unit cells, they start tying them up, they do a reasonably good job of that. And then they realize, oh, I need like some decoder or something like over here. And, you know, of course, first time around, they go and they build the decoder and they slap it down up at the top like this. Okay, now, hopefully enough of you in the room are kind of experienced enough to realize what's wrong with this picture, which is simply that, well, look, you know, the stuff that's up over here is totally misaligned with anything related to the unit cells. And if I really put it that close, guess what? You know, this cell is not going to behave the, the same as that cell, and then, you know, I'm going to fab the chip and it's going to come back and have some kind of, you know, DNL, INL, etc. right? Now, obviously you'd say, oh, well, but this is silly, like, just put a dummy in or something like this, and indeed, those are the kinds of things you do. But now you start thinking about some of these more subtle effects and you realize that it's not only just you know, these simple rules you have to pay attention to. So as another example, let's say there's someone else, somewhere else in the array over here, and you, know, you build this whole DAC and then you hand it over to the SOC team. And the SOC team realizes, oh, actually I need to route like, this wire you know, up in like, I don't know, metal 10 or something up above you, because like, I need to get across this array. Well, guess what? Uh, you know, the presence of this wire even up on that very high metal layer versus not. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I should go over to the side there. There you go. <laughs> Thank you. Right, the presence of this, you know, high-level metal wire up on the top versus not will actually change the matching characteristics of the transistors. Okay, and this is actually something uh, I think Marcel Pellegrin presented on at ISC probably about a decade ago or so. But essentially things like, you know, release of hydrogen atoms, you know, essentially is modulated by the presence or absence of higher-level metals. And so therefore your matching characteristics can also be varied depending upon that effect. So the point here is, again, just to say that, you know, there are many, many ways that, you know, you can kind of go and do th have things that are very subtle happen that will mess up your layout. And if you go and you talk to some of the folks who work on analog layout automation, they usually sort of complain that a lot of times people won't even explain what the issue really is. They'll just say, it doesn't look right. Okay, and so it doesn't look right is really just a proxy for, well, there's some thing that I've seen before that went wrong that caused me a problem. And now, you know, I see your tool doing this thing, so like, please don't do that. And, you know, even if I can't explain to you why, just there's an extra constraint you have to obey. So this is where sort of the human factor comes in, in the sense that, 
yes, you can sort of build these automated tools based on general purpose you know, algorithms, but the issue you run into is that designers, particularly analog designers, really don't like spending their time writing constraints. Okay? In general, I think they actually prefer to just say, look, I wanted to do X, right? Because again, the space of things you can do is relatively small, so it's much easier to specify what you do want to do rather than taking a general purpose tool and forcing it to not do all the things that actually should not be done. So, you know, the point here is not to say it's all doom and gloom. Obviously, you know, I wouldn't be here if I didn't believe there are things that we can do. And in particular, I think the, the sort of the main switch to kind of flip in our minds is that it's not so much that we necessarily want to quote unquote automate things. I think it's really much more that we want to be much better about reusing what it is that we do already. Okay? So for those of you who were here in the beginning, I gave you the warning that this was kind of like going to be a slide where you should remember one thing if you remember nothing else. This is it. Okay? So the whole point here is that when I say that I want to write a quote unquote generator, what this really means is that I want to take the approach you yourself were already using to come up with your designs, both from a layout, a sizing, and so on and so forth standpoint. And rather than you manually re-executing that approach every single time you want to come up with a new specific design, a specific design instance, what you should instead be doing is writing a program that would follow the same set of steps that you yourself would have taken, so that now if you change things like parameters or you know, add some additional feature or so on and so forth, what you're really doing is now rerunning that piece of code rather than you yourself kind of you know, pushing all the buttons and making that happen. Okay? So that's what I mean when I say that we have a generator. It's really just saying, look, you know, this, whatever this process was, whatever way you went about doing this, I now want to write some code that represents all these different pieces of that puzzle and re-execute that code whenever I want a new piece of, or a new specific design to come out of it. So to be clear here, like, you know, you might be wondering, well, can I really do this? Is this actually possible? And the short answer is yes. You know, we've had a number of demonstrations, mostly driven on the UC Berkeley side of things that indeed you know, are really showing kind of closing the entire design loop. And I kind of took a little bit of artistic license here to sort of emphasize that, look, again, most of the design loop these days is actually spent on the layout side, not really on you know, the sizing and things like this. It's really just getting all the way through that and really getting back the performance you want. And so to be clear, the reason that generators can really help here is that, as I said from the get-go, now if my generator is actually parameterized, so for example, let's say you know, I build an amplifier and it's not just you know, the 1 gigahertz, you know, 10 dB gain kind of thing, but now you know, the gain is a parameter, the bandwidth is a parameter, and now I need 20 different amplifiers, well, fine, I just enter all those different parameters into my generator. And if I myself as a human designer knew how to build those things, my generator will also be able to successfully produce those designs. Right, so the productivity gain is coming from the fact that now I don't have to do all those different instances. The code itself is what can do it. The other thing which I think is actually very important is, you know, I'm sure all of you are very familiar with this, with this you know, sort of fact that you, know, you go, you start building something, and then you realize, like, whatever, three weeks before the tape about, oh, oops, like, there's this extra feature that you know, the standard just added or some system architect figured out is actually needed to make everything work. And, you know, when we do things today, sometimes it's a relatively straightforward thing to do, and sometimes it's, you, know, you have to go and kind of like rip everything up because it has implications on other parts of the design that you never thought of. Well, the point here is that, again, if I have a piece of code and I understood the methodology I was taking, if I want to add a new feature in, what I should be doing is incrementally extending that code, not refiguring out all of the other stuff that I did previously. Finally, as we'll be showing you a little bit further as we go here, you know, if you really do things right, and again, I'll clarify kind of what I mean by doing things right, process portability should really kind of come out of this in a very natural fashion. And that's mostly obviously driven by the layout side, but a lot of this is also just driven by the same notion of, if I understood what are the tests that I need to do, what are the sort of constraints I need to obey to actually go through and do a design, you know, the design itself is not really actually linked to the process technology. The process technology tells you the numbers you should be using, but it's not usually affecting the algorithm that you follow. So with all that in mind, what I'm going to do is just give you a little bit more of an overview on sort of, you know, the Berkeley Analog Generator Framework or BAG overall, a few of the kind of key results that we've gotten, uh, again, mostly from the UC Berkeley side. I'll then tell you some more details on the layout generator side because I think that's kind of where a lot of the, the key meat and potatoes really is. Uh, we'll switch over to sort of a, a demonstration that Eric will run uh, remotely. Uh, so hopefully all the IT stuff will, will stay alive long enough to, to make that feasible. Um, I'll then say a little bit more about what I'm going to call a design script, I'll clarify what I mean by that in a moment, and then we'll switch over to one more demo before we wrap everything up and open up for questions. Okay, so basically, hopefully I've convinced you there's at least some interest in taking this generator-based design type of approach. 
Um, and if there is interest, then the question is, well, okay, just you know, boots on the ground, how do I really make this happen? And so all bag really is is exactly this, essentially just a set of Python code that to zero order mostly is essentially just providing a bunch of plumbing that actually does let you specify in Python what is the real design procedure you yourself would have used to go and build some analog mix signal circuit. Now to be clear, you're going to do all this in a hierarchical fashion, right? So once you have a generator of some sub-block, you can then use it for other larger blocks that maybe want to use that sub-block. But again, really all it's trying to do is allow you to specify your design procedure in an executable format, which again in this case happens to be in Python. The other thing which is actually you know, much more than just plumbing, and we'll see that a little bit later, is it does actually define what we consider to be a very process portable interface into the layout itself. So you really can generate real GDS, real polygons at the end of the day. And in case it wasn't obvious, all of this was developed at UC Berkeley under the DARPA Craft program. Okay, so what I want to do now is just give you a little bit of nomenclature, because I'm going to say a few things that you know, will not make sense later if, if I don't sort of clarify this. So if I start thinking about building a complete circuit generator, um, you know, just from a software standpoint, we can partition this in many different ways. And in particular, the way we like to partition these is that we basically kind of build it into three big blocks. Okay? So the first two, or the first one is what I'm going to call kind of the schematic generator, okay? where the idea here is that its job is really very simple. You feed it in a set of very low level parameters, things like widths and lengths and number of fingers. And it just literally goes and produces the actual schematic for you, typically you know, in a cadence virtuoso representation. Similarly, the layout generator, which now is starting to become much more sophisticated, but nonetheless, you will feed it in, once again, fairly low-level parameters, so things like you know, widths of transistors, lengths of transistors, number of fingers, perhaps even you know, some other constraints like you know, area and so on and so forth. And its job is to just to go and produce the DRC LV LVS correct layouts of that particular circuit block with those low-level parameters. The final piece here is what I'm going to call the design script, where its job is to basically say, okay, look, you know, if I'm building the circuit generator, if I want to make it usable, I probably don't want the interface into it to be like you know, transistor widths and lengths, right? You want something like, say, gain, bandwidth, distortion, and so on and so forth. So the job of this design script is to take in those higher level performance specifications and essentially figure out how to convert them into the lower level parameters that the layout and schematic generators would need to actually produce the real specific instances, okay? Now, it's kind of indicated a little bit here in this diagram, but you know, it's not to say that these are all like completely feed forward, right? In fact, there's often going to be feedback loops involved through several of these, and in particular, the design script oftentimes will do things where you know, it'll take a guess at a sizing, produce an actual layout, extract it, and then feedback and make modifications, right? So this is a lot where that kind of overall design loop comes into the picture. Okay, so this is just showing you a few example instances that have been produced using this approach. Um, all of these kind of came from, from UC Berkeley. Um, so, and this is also just trying to highlight a little bit that indeed all of this is intended to be hierarchical, right? So let's say you start out with something relatively simple like, I don't know, like a switch capacitor DAC or something like this. You know, then maybe you like, you know, pair it up with like a comparator, maybe some like logic, then you can start building like, like a SAR ADC. Then maybe you have several of these SAR ADCs, you put those together along with some bias stacks and things like this, then you can actually do like a full time interleaved type of structure. Uh, similarly, you know, if you start building up and you know, take many of these components, build up even you know, things like complete uh, you know, serializer to serializers. In this case, I'm showing you the receive side. Uh, you, know, you can do this for photonic devices, photonic signal chains. You know, this is just kind of a subsampling, but this is to give you the idea that indeed, what, as you start building up the complexity of these generators and really making use of the fact that you can actually build these things in a hierarchical way, indeed, you can actually get to pretty large subsystems pretty quickly by taking this kind of approach. Now, I showed you a bunch of individual kind of point instances in that previous slide. So just to prove, yes, these are really actually generators. Um, you know, so here I'm showing you, for example, this was a generator for a decision feedback equalizer in a high-speed Surtees. Um, so here it's just showing you there are actually, you know, in one case it's four taps, in the other case it's six taps. Um, and if you kind of you know, squint really hard, you might be able to see it's not just like a straightforward extension of everything. There's actually some rerouting that has to be done to really make this thing work. Similarly, and you know, this is uh, some of my friends that work in silicon photonics space. You know, they're collaborating with folks that you know are doing the silicon photonics themselves, and then end up getting kind of hybrid bonded onto this particular chip that you know our friends were working on. Well, in that case, you know, the devices were under design and constantly you know being changed all the time, and so therefore the, the pitch of the bumps to kind of interface between those two sort of dialects was also something that was changing all the time. 
And so this is just another example of, okay, if I actually have a generator where I know sort of how I would move my circuit around to try and match up optimally with varying bump pitch, same thing. You can see there's some pretty wild confirmations in the way the circuit is set up, depending upon what the bump pitch actually ends up being. And all of these are just instances that came from one single generator. So with that out of the way, the next thing I want to spend sort of you know, a good chunk of time on is just the layout generators themselves, and in particular, some of the key concepts that we use there. Uh, and then we'll dive a little bit into the demo side of it. So on the layout side, you know, th there's kind of a couple of really key and important concepts that I think allow us to be productive here. Um, and the first one is perhaps fairly obvious and you've probably heard a lot about already, but I just want to be sort of explicitly clear about. So, First of all, BAG does not restrict you from drawing anything you want. Okay? So in principle, there is essentially quote unquote APIs built into BAG that you know, if you literally wanted to just draw like you know, a one micron by one micron you know, piece of poly or whatever it is in a certain spot, absolutely you can do that. The point however is that if you really think about, well, I wanna make sure that everything that I do is kind of gonna be DRC correct, process portable, scalable, and so on and so forth. You know, just capturing polygon drawing commands probably is not going to be the most efficient way to do that, right? Because you can imagine, you know, from process A to process B, what you have to do to actually get a set of polygons to act to be correct is going to vary quite wildly. So instead, what most of the generators we end up writing really uh, rely on is that we just say, look, we're going to assume that the world consists essentially of grids, right? And essentially on each individual layer, we're going to say, you know, each layer is either horizontal or vertical. And that on each one of those layers, we're going to define what is sort of you know, a track in that layer, what is the width of that track in terms of the metal wire, and what's the spacing of that track. Now, to be clear, and as shown in the picture here, right, this isn't to say that you can't draw wires that are wider than one track. Um, so you can have you know, multi-track width wires, uh, modulo, obviously, this being correct on a DRC standpoint. But the point is that, again, everything is sort of done in this track-based type of system. Because now if I start dealing with tracks, the tracks themselves as a concept can be much more uh, flexible and process portable. And by flexible here I mean that you know, it's much more, if you really force yourself to follow this grid-based kind of structure, uh, as Alvin was saying, you know, when you look at what the process guys are really optimizing for, it's these relatively uniform sort of arrays of you know, wires. Well, this is kind of just accepting that and say, okay, well, if this is what we actually want to end up building, then let's just explicitly enforce that in this essentially layout API to make it so that it's much easier to keep track of these things and move from one process to the next. Now, again, to be clear here, when I say that I have tracks on the different layers, right, when you move from process A to process B, this is where you can then figure out, okay, well, what is the actual right width for this process? What's the right spacing for this process on these different layers? And that's where you can sort of start actually mapping between the real tracks, excuse me, between the tracks that you have an abstraction and the real layout that's under the hood. Okay, so the other sort of really key insight, and you know, I said before there was like one thing that you should remember from the talk. This is perhaps the second one, especially on the layout side. The other, I think, really important key insight is that if you really pay close attention to the types of layouts that people do in the analog mixed signals domain, I'm going to make a fairly strong statement, but I'm going to walk through a you know, specific example to show you why, why I say it, which is that I'm going to say that a lot of the times the quote-unquote concept one uses for your floor plan tends to actually be quite portable across different process technologies. Okay? So this is kind of a, you know, jumping ahead a little bit, but you know, this here is just showing you like a simple differential amplifier which we wrote one piece of code, and the only thing we did under the hood was change the actual primitives of the specific process technology. And these three processes you know, are actually quite different from each other. But basically, that same one piece of code you know, produced DRC LVS correct, you know, in fact, actually sort of specification correct once you added in the design script on all three of these things. Okay? And the reason, again, just has to do with if you sort of stare a little bit at these things, the floor plan structure actually looks pretty similar. right? The details of, you know, what is the sizing, what types of transistors do you have, exactly where are contacts, all these obviously are varying quite a bit, but you can kind of see this structure where, you know, there's rows of devices, you know, with kind of a lot of vertical interconnect between them, and I'll explain why that is in a second. And then kind of, you know, from, you know, let's say from one edge of the block to the other, there's these horizontal wires that seem to be carrying the inputs and outputs, okay? So again, I'm going to argue that if we realize that the floor plan concept itself tends to be relatively constant, then we can just essentially create something that abstracts that floor plan concept. So you can then write code that you know, essentially deals with those concepts. That will move from one process to the next, and then we can write primitives underneath it that enable us to actually implement any one specific process technology's real designs. 
So again, the point here is that the generator itself is capturing both the design details and the specific sizing approach, as well as obviously the concept of the floor plan, but it doesn't need to know the exact geometries involved. And to be clear, and you, know, you should take a look at the CICC 2018 paper, you know, we, we've built generators that really have been able to scale across many, many different process technologies by using this approach. Okay, so what I want to do now is just sort of start building up a little bit the case study that we're going to use to kind of, you know, see this. Uh, we'll be seeing actually this pretty much exact circuit in the demo as well. So this case study is just a very simple differential amplifier. So essentially, you know, sort of like an NMOS tail device, uh, a pair of NMOS inputs, and just some PMOS loading device. So kind of like, you know, the five transistor amplifier that most of you are probably familiar with is the thing that we have in mind here. So the first and most important point to realize is, again, something I was hinting at a moment ago, which is that basically a lot of times with these typical analog circuits, it's really electromigration that drives the entire sort of layout strategy. Okay, so why do I say this? Well, especially on the lower layers, there's a certain amount of current you can actually get out of the transistor before you just blow up the, you know, the metal interconnect that's getting the current out of that device in the first place. So what this basically says is that you know, once you've figured out sort of an appropriate current density for your device and its associated interconnect, now if you want to get more current than that, you end up having to parallel these things essentially in the horizontal dimension, right? Because, you know, if I want twice the current, now I have twice the device, twice the metal, and everything just sort of scales naturally. I don't have to keep rechecking that same electromigration constraint, okay? Well, so the implication of this is that if you then think about constructing a floor plan of the actual circuit this way, this implies that anything that has kind of DC current flowing through it, so in this case, any connections from, you know, one row of transistors to the other inside of the amplifier, indeed should be carried essentially on all these vertical wires that again you've essentially sized up a priori to meet the electromigration constraints. Okay? So the next implication of this is that if I think about you know, how should I arrange the ports of the transistors, well essentially the drain, source, and gate, they should also show up as vertical wires because again most of the connections within the block are going to be flowing vertically in that manner. The next point is something that I again highlighted last time, which is that, well, okay, so if I've got sort of this amplifier where all the stuff internally is being carried by vertical wires because of this electromigration constraint, then typically speaking from block to block, that's where you're going to have things essentially going horizontally, right? So for example, in this case, the inputs are going to flow horizontally, in this case, from the left to the right, and the outputs are going to flow essentially from the left over to the right as well, okay? And the other thing that's kind of nice about this is that there's relatively little current flowing through these horizontal wires, right? To the extent that the transistor fingers are kind of matched with each other, most of the DC current should be flowing completely vertically. And so the horizontal stuff is really just carrying essentially the AC currents and the signals in and out of the block. So the last thing, which is kind of like the way that we can now start thinking about really building a so-called API into these types of layouts, is just to say that now, okay, well, if I know that most of my kind of internal connections are flowing vertically, then what's really going to sort of set up the overall floor plan is just how many wires do I need essentially on horizontal tracks to make connections between those vertical wires. And in particular for each transistor row, I can kind of figure out, well, okay, what are all the signals associated with that transistor row? How many kind of tracks of horizontal wires do I need? And once I know that, I can then say, okay, well, that's kind of like the, 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 the unit element that I'm going to put down into my layout. And as long as I can make sure that, you know, from, for example, the horizontal tracks up over here, I can make connections either to the drain, source, or gate of the transistors underneath, then basically that should allow me to actually construct this floor plan. So this particular style of floor plan that I've been talking about in the sort of the bag nomenclature is what we call quote-unquote analog base. Okay, so analog base is just implying that it is exactly this type of floor plan with, you know, again, mostly vertical connections with, you know, from one transistor row to the next and horizontal connections, you know, from block to block, as well as a couple of other assumptions that we make to sort of say that, okay, if you're gonna build a quote unquote good analog layout, these are practices that you're probably gonna be following and so we wanna capture inside of this typical style. And what analog base is doing is it's giving you a lot of functions under the hood that are kind of dealing with specifically how do I actually implement this in any one particular process technology, as long as you are indeed following this specific type of approach for doing the layout. So one of the kind of important things is just, well, okay, so how do, about, do I go about actually abstracting the transistors? And as I was hinting at a lot previously, you know, because of the fact that we're gonna end up wanting to connect things vertically within the block, you end up wanting to bake it so that, you know, whenever you make connections to the transistors, that's gonna be done through essentially just vertical ports, right? So you wanna find kind of what's the right metal layer that creates an appropriate vertical port to actually connect down into drain, source, or gate of the transistors. Now, the other thing that's kind of being shown here, which is another very important detail, is that 
the sort of the way we've chosen to make this abstraction work is we're basically going to say that the gate is either going to show up on a vertical port that's aligned to what I'm going to call the drain side of the device, or it's going to show up on the on a port, excuse me, on a track that's aligned to the source side of the device. So why is it that we have to do this? Well, if you sort of think about it, and I'm going to use my fingers here, so you know those of you in person and the camera will hopefully be able to see this. Um, if you kind of think about a transistor, there's three things that are happening, right? There's a source, a gate, and a drain. In most process technologies, once you get above the absolute lowest metal layers, you can't actually fit three wires in that pitch, right? Your smallest pitch is usually the same thing as the source drain pitch. So because of this, what you end up having to do is you have to say, okay, well, I'm gonna take like two wires, for example, the drain and the source in one direction, and then the gates either on one of those two tracks down or up, depending upon how you made the choice, okay? So that's exactly why you end up with this choice of, okay, well, the gate either has to end up on a drain track or a source track. But once you've made that decision, then you kind of know sort of how to make the connections moving forward. And in fact, picking which one is which, you can basically figure out based on the other parameters in the layout. And you'll see some examples of this in a moment when we really go into the code. Okay, so the last and perhaps most important piece of this is, you know, once I've abstracted what the transistors are, which again just basically comes down to I have these three connections that I have to make on these vertical ports, then now to sort of figure out what the overall floor plan looks like, really the only thing that's left to do is first just figure out, well, how many transistor rows are there and what types of transistors? So for example, are they, you know, all NMOS devices, PMOS devices, how many of them do I stack, and so on and so forth. But second, and actually probably much more importantly, for each one of these transistor rows, I'm gonna decide how many horizontal tracks do I want to be able to connect to the particular primitive ports of that transistor, okay? And just from a nomenclature standpoint here, we label kind of one side of the transistor, in this case, you know, on this bottom row, everything that's below, quote unquote, the transistors as being the drain source tracks, and everything that's, quote unquote, above the transistors as being the gate tracks. Now, it's not that really they have to be above and below, it's just sort of, let's say, a directionality thing of, you know, as you add more and more tracks kind of on one side, that would be called the gate side, and you add more tracks on the other, that's called the drain source side. But again, what these are really implying is that, you know, where are the tracks that can make legal, valid connections into the transistor? So that once I've defi this, defined that, then I can actually sort of start building up these floor plans that we saw a second ago. And again, just to clarify, when we start talking about, you know, sort of, well, like, how do you know, like, how, like, you know, how to space these tracks, you know, how wide they are, and so on and so forth, again, all of that is handled by either selecting what the routing grid is, or by essentially the process-specific primitive code that really knows the details of all the DRC rules to make it so you can actually construct these things in a correct way. And in fact, analog base is pretty nice. In fact, it has you know, additional functionality inside of it to go in, like, in a DRC correct way, add things like dummies, have you know, edge devices, edge cells, uh, you know, figure out, make sure that density is gonna be correct, and so on and so forth. So I've said a lot of stuff. I think what I wanna do now is actually sort of you know, hand the ball over to Eric uh, so he can really show you sort of a demonstration of this you know, in practice. Uh, so Eric, are you still there? Uh, yeah, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, so I think we, we see your screen already, Eric. We've got the nice layout up, so I'll, I'll let you uh, take it over from there. Okay, so this is the, the layout of a differential amplifier that Elon have been walking through as a case study. Uh, just to be clear, this is done in the fake technology designed by Cadence, so we won't have any NDA issues. Uh, so basically, I was just kind of walk through how back and track with virtual code to generate the layout and also walk through the how the code for this differential amplifier is written. So first, I already generated some layout and I'm just going to delete it to so we're sure that the code is actually generating new layout. And for those of you who are in the room, don't worry about attempting to read the text there. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. you'll, uh, you'll, you'll have readable text in a moment. <laughs> Yeah, so basically, so this is uh, the amplifier code. We will walk through it, but let me just generate it first. So you can see as a generator aspect, uh, here is where I feed in the parameters of this differential amplifier. So you specify what the channel length is, what's the width of the transistor in terms of number of pins for each row, and also the threshold voltage for each type of transistor. And, and then, then you can, can specify a number of fingers, number of dummies on each side, and so on and so forth. So I can just make some changes here, run the code. 
Unfortunately, the output of this code, the font size is kind of small, but basically to show that the layout is done. Then here in the virtuoso log, you can see here there are some messages. Uh, it's probably too hard for you to read, but basically they just say it receives commands from back to generate new layout. So we see that the library we deleted before has popped up again, and I'm able to look at this layout. Like this. Yeah. So next I'm just going to kind of walk through the code of this differential amplifier. Uh, so you kind of see a real example of what uh, what Elon just described. So first, for every generator, we you define a corresponding Python class that will handle drawing the layout when given the parameters. And then given every generator, you have to declare what kind of parameters your generator support, which we have seen below there. And this is just a method that declare I have these parameters and a brief description of what each of the parameters does. Then most of your Python code will actually happen in this function called draw layout. And you can see in the beginning, I'm just getting the parameters that the user has given me. And then, so then the first step of this layout generator is you want to draw the transistor array. So if I look back in the layout here, so, so you can see that the floor line here is pretty simple. I have substrate tab on the top and bottom for ground and VDD respectively. And then I have a row of MOS tail transistor, a row of MOS input transistor, and a row of PMOS load transistors. So that means here I need to have two rows of MOS and one row of PMOS. So, so to do so, you just create a list of row parameter for the MOS and PMOS. So that's what the code here is shown. And in addition, you just like Elon said, because the transistor, the height of the transistor array is determined by your horizontal routing tracks, you have to specify how many tracks you want. So for for this particular example, because it's a differential pair, I have I need to have two input for the MOS input pair, and I'll have two differential output wires. So. So I need at least two wires. However, analog designers know that the parasitic capacitance between differential wires is, dub is double because they always move in the opposite direction. So generally, you want more spacing between the differential wire if you care about the bandwidth. So in this case, going back to the code, you can see that I I, sp I request three routing tracks for the input and three routing tracks for the output. So the one extra track I just used to add extra space between the differential wire. Then after that, you can see that you simply call this draw base method and you dump all the row parameters inside. Then it will analog base will automatically create a transistor array for you. That next, after the transistor array is created, you will create compact to each of the transistors. So we can kind of show here. So I need to make this editable. It should just be able to move on its own. Yeah. So for example, now you can see this. The cell consists of many different sub-blocks. So here's a, one of the sub-blocks is just drawing the row of transistor, the active device, whereas I have these two other cells that only have metal that connect all the way from the diffusion up to a vertical metal layer. And in this case, it's the green metal here, which is metal three. So back to the code here, that's basically what this draw mos command is doing. So basically here you're saying 
For the left input device, I want to connect to row index 1 because the index start at 0. So row index 1 is the second MOS row. Then you say it was this transistor will start from this column index, which is computed here. And then I, I will use this many number of fingers. And then after that, you specify the gate drain and source direction the drain and the drain and source direction to to see why that's necessary uh so we need to look at the floor plan again so we have differential input pair here and our tail device is below and you can see the source of the input device is connected to the tail transistor drain this way so we know that we these source wires need to go down to make that connection and that means I need to the only place where I can draw the gate vertical wire is interleave between the source row to allow my fourth wires to be able to escape down so that calculation is determined by the source drain uh, direction parameter then after that, you can you there is this connect to substring method to connect uh, the source of the tail device and the source of the drain device to DVD, uh, ground and VDD respectively. So that's because the way this analog floor plan works is that the first and last row is always the substrate contact. So that method is provided for convenience if you can. If you are just connecting the source to the supply, which happens quite often in analog layout. So then, now that the transistor connections are created, you, you can query for the track, the horizontal track indices that you can use to connect to, the, to various rows. So, so here, so, so here, here, for example, let's take this line. So, so to get the horizontal track that corresponds to the positive input, you just say, I want the gate track of MMOS row 1 and index number 2. So in this layout here, that will correspond to this top horizontal wire. So remember, I allocated three tracks in this region, so, so I planned it such that the track 0 is the negative input and track 1 is left empty to add extra space between the differential wire. And then, and then the positive input will be track index number 2. So by making this, by calling this function, you can get the track indices of those various horizontal metal track and then now since the draw mos con method already connect your transistor to vertical routing layer you can use a simple uh, grid routing api to connect those vertical tracks together or short them to a horizontal metal track which is done in the code here and then at the end, you can simply call the add pin method to export any geometry in this uh, layout generator as pins. So, by the way, are there any questions? Uh, we can be a little bit interactive here. If you have a specific question about the code or the layout. Any questions in the room? Yeah, Jim. So, I was expecting a little bit more Yeah, so let me, let me repeat the question. So uh, the question was, well, I was, I was thinking there'd be a little bit more high-level automation than this, because, um, you know, if you start kind of like specifying polygons and things, then like, you know, is that really different than quote-unquote P-cells? So I think there's kind of two important things. Um, the first is, remember, our goal is not quote-unquote automation, it's actually reuse, right? Because if I, I mean, I'm going to argue that if we gave you too much quote-unquote automation, you'll give me back the it doesn't look right answer. <laughs> so 
the control here is very much intentional. Now, having said that, and you know, I don't know if Eric can actually show it, we're not talking about a, a, a lot of lines of code here, right? Because if you actually think about it, you didn't do any calculations about the real space is, you know, what the density is, you know, what the sort of size of the fingers needs to be. All of that stuff is actually being figured out, you know, essentially under the hood inside of the primitives. So, you know, just to clarify for you, you know, the first time I went through this, it took me about, yeah, I'd say 25 minutes or so, and I was able to sort of like actually recomplete this entire code. And now, Eric, here's where you should actually do the demo, you know, go change like, you know, I don't know, two of the finger widths or something like that and rerun it, and, you know, you'll get a brand new layout out. Um, so I think there is actually a decent amount of abstraction that's happening in terms of a lot of the low level details that, that you know, are sort of initially giving you this feeling. But it is absolutely true that you still need to think about, well, what is my floor plan? Where do I want to place my input wires relative to my devices? Where do I want to place my output wires relative to my devices? What things are connected to what? Absolutely, you still think about that inside of these low level layout generators. And I'm going to argue that actually that's a feature because that's the way you get it to look the way you want and not the way you know, that you don't want it to look. Now, having said all of that, by the way, obviously once you've done this, if I have a set of lower level blocks, then you start building these higher level generators. The higher level generators are not going to deal as much with these kinds of things. But nonetheless, you know, if you want to be able to place, well, I have this like, differential connection between this block and this block, and I want to know exactly where it goes and how it's connected, that's again where this level of control is, is what you actually want. It's a good question. Other questions? Uh, I think, as Eric said, we're, we're happy to keep this part interactive because that's a, that'll help learning, I assume. <laughs> yes? Ah, okay. So the question was, can you guarantee that it's all passing DRC? Um, depends what you mean by guarantee. So, and, and there's two issues there, right? So one is the as Jim was kind of asking about, we give you enough control that you can certainly do things that there's no way to pass DRC on them, right? So you can try and like force the thing to draw layouts that just make no sense whatsoever, right? And so absolutely, it is still possible to make DRC errors. I'm, not, I'm gonna argue that's not really quote unquote bag's fault that has much more to do with just, you know, if you come up with a floor plan that is not actually feasible for whatever reason, then, then yes, you can actually still do that. Having said that, you'll notice in the API that was there, as long as you chose the tracks in a way that, you know, the tracks will not be DRC consistent, you chose them also in a way that vias and everything else like that are feasible to actually create. Um, and there is actually some, let's say, intelligence under the hood in terms of how bag figures out when to use, for example, like cut type structures and you know, when to put in like additional dummies to meet density. So that's where a little bit of the sort of actual automation is happening because that's, you know, stuff that it knows specifically about the process technology. That's where a lot of these sort of shortcuts on DRC are happening. But uh, I guess the way I would say it is, a lot of that work is actually put onto the primitive designer, not onto everyone who's writing the layout generators. Yeah, yeah just, just, just to show an actual example from this layout, uh, if you look carefully, you'll see that although in the, in the code, I only specify three rows of transistors, it seems like in this, it seems like this layout actually have four, so to be clear, I'll just move those rows of transistor outside, right? You can see that there are four rows of transistor instead of three. So what is this row? This is because uh, in our primitive, we actually, to, to make the fake technology be more realistic to some more challenging uh, actual technology we've seen before, we added a constraint that there must, there is a maximum distance allowed between, maximum uh, vertical distance allowed between active regions of transistors. So here, in the analog base, when you say you want three rows of MMOS and you want three horizontal gate routing tracks for the input there, it, it went through all the DRC calculation and decided that these two rows need to be spaced as much apart, but then it realized that this will violate that maximum vertical spacing constraint in the DRC rule, and it automatically added a row of dummy transistor in between these two rows in order to satisfy that DRC. So just so basically the, the point here is that there is a lot of very complex 
process-specific calculation that's done to translate the user process portable specification into the actual geometry being drawn. But the advantage is that since that's all primitive, in the primitive side of the code, the designer doesn't have to worry about that anymore. Yeah, so, so said a different way, basically, what we're fairly explicitly trying to do here is we're trying to say, look, we're going to break things into two kind of explicit steps. What we're saying is that what most designers should be dealing with is this notion of, I have transistor rows and some number of tracks around that transistor row that I want to be able to specify. Right? And then it's the designer's job to figure out what is the floor plan, how many tracks do you want to use, what tracks are associated with which transistors. What the primitive is doing is saying, okay, if you tell me I need a transistor row with this many tracks in it and it's stacked with another transistor row and another one and so on and so forth, it's now the primitive's job to figure out how do I actually can get those two things to connect to each other in a DRC correct way. And as Eric said, there can actually be some complex math you end up doing, for example, to say, okay, is there a maximum spacing between you know, sort of one OD region and another OD region, or is there a maximum like, you know, sort of density sort of rule that you have to meet, and so on and so forth. But that problem is basically partitioned into those two conceptual things, because basically you know, the primitive stuff, once somebody solves those things, that's then available to everybody. Right? Whereas your specific floor plan as a designer, that's really mostly where you're dealing with how many transistor rows do I have and how many tracks are associated with those rows. that answer your question? Or? Probably got more than you were expecting from the simple question, so. <laughs> Mostly tracking, I guess. <laughs> Correct, yeah. So if, yes, uh, in general, you know, I, I'm, I shouldn't say nobody should be a believer in, but in general, you know, designers are not typically believers in correct by construction, right? Because you know, at the end of the day, it's a piece of code, right? So somebody can write code that does something totally weird that, you know, somebody never thought of and, you know, creates a new case. And so, yes, absolutely always run DRC at the end. In fact, uh, I guess you couldn't see it. We always run both DRC and LVS to check that, indeed, whatever we produced is actually correct. Uh, yeah, so actually you'll see that in a moment. Um, I don't know if you actually ran it on this particular one because the demo is just intended to show you the specific, uh, you know, uh, layout of this. You'll see in a moment sort of how we typically include post layout simulations into the overall design script flow. More questions? Yeah. So normally in design people would use a piece of primitive and they would assemble it from those. And now you seem to be duplicating that here. And that's sort of the deliverable of the thing in case the piece cells are already there. Why wouldn't you want to yeah, so it's a great question. So the question had to do with, well, it seems like we're sort of skipping P-cells entirely. Um, I'll be careful with who's in the room here. Um, so there's a lot of, the short answer is there's many reasons that we skip the P-cells entirely. Um, some of them have to do with essentially performance issues you get into if you really want to use actual P-cells and make sure all the skill callbacks happen correctly. Um, for better or for worse, you know, this is not the default operating mode most people use when using P-cells, you know, actually coming in from an external API you know, programming interface. Um, but somewhat separately from that, I think the short answer is that by creating this specific abstraction, there's actually a lot of stuff in the P-cells that we just absolutely don't care about. And so it's actually much easier for us to just go and write this and obey this abstraction and I would say in practice, and this is again, you know, flipping hats on the UC Berkeley side, you know, from watching how long it has taken Eric to write primitives in various different processes that we had access to at UC Berkeley, um, that's much, much faster than any P-cell development time that I've ever seen. And a lot of that has to do with we're not trying to do all the things P-cells are trying to do. We're just specifically trying to meet these particular abstractions. Yeah. It's a very good question. Uh, I think there was one more person who had, yes. Ah, okay, so I think the question was, is there some limit on how much you can scale? Um, horizontally, well, I think from a layout standpoint, probably the only thing you might run into is some like, you know, maximum, you know, the, well, actually in, in the, actually in this one, probably not. So horizontally, you could hypothetically kind of go pretty much almost as far as you wanted. Um, the only issue that you might run into is then from an actual electrical performance standpoint, the RC of those wires might st start to be an issue. And then you might need to actually go back and say, oh, well, actually I need like a three track wide wire instead of one or things like this. But from a DRC standpoint, I think this particular scaling is probably pretty easy. There are plenty of other things where, for example, if you started saying, well, 
I want to like squeeze the vertical dimension or you know, change the number of tracks, that's where some of these, let's say, uh, boundary cases might become more problematic to deal with. Uh, no, actually, it's, it's a little bit hard to see, but every, all the trans, well, so I, I should be careful. All the transistors actually have different widths, but the way it's arranged, and actually, Eric, if you can pull up the layout one more time, the way it's arranged is what you'll see is that everything is kind of centered on a center line. And so things that are wider expand out horizontally more than others. So you'll kind of see like, you know, this either hourglass or other type of profile where everything else is filled in as dummies. Yeah, I guess this particular parameter set doesn't make that as clear, but you can kind of see like there's a little bit of, you know, there's less blue kind of in those center regions. Those are the real devices and stuff on the outside of the dummies. It does, however, indeed assume that because you care about matching, and this is why this is analog based as opposed to, for example, a digital base, that you really do want to put everything into unit length, you know, or, or same length <laughs> transistor rows, just to make sure the matching is, is done well. Yeah, it's a very good question. Okay, oh, it looks like Eric just ran a much wider thing just to show live that indeed, uh, you know, you can do that. <laughs> Yeah, uh, but as you can see, if you go too crazy, uh, in, the in the end, end you are worry about actually the horizontal resistance of these routing wires. So, but then you can improve the generator by smartly thicken the wire as a function of metal resistance, so to speak. Right. Right. And the way you do that is you go back instead of saying, you know, oh, it's now like three tracks on this one, maybe it needs to be like 10 tracks and so on and so forth. Great. So Eric, I think I'm going to flip back to the slides and then hand it over to you one more time in a second here. Okay. okay. Yeah, so now that we've spent some good quality time on the layout side of things, uh, the other piece that, that you know typically sort of kind of, let's say, uh, is a mental block for people until they see a specific example is what I'm going to call the so-called design script. So what we wanted to do is, again, just walk through one, uh, in many cases, oversimplified, but one example of this to give people an idea of how you'd go about actually writing a quote-unquote design script. So as a reminder, the job of the design script is to take the higher level specifications, you know, gain, bandwidth, so on and so forth, and convert them into actual lower level parameters that you'd feed into the schematic and layout generators. So again, for the sake of example, let's assume that we're going to be playing with this inverter-based, you know, simple amplifier. Um, and so for the sake of argument, let's assume we want to operate it where the, where the bias point is such that the input is equal to the output. So this is like the nominal bias condition. We're going to assume, again, for the sake of simplicity, that the lengths of the PMOS devices are the same as the length of the NMOS devices. We're going to specify some explicit load capacitance CL. We're going to say we want to make sure this amplifier achieves some minimum gain, voltage gain AV, some minimum bandwidth F bandwidth, and as usual, we just want to minimize the power to meet all of these other specifications. Okay, so. I'm a design equations kind of guy. If you prefer other methods, that fine. You'll see in a moment that you can actually do that uh, perfectly easily too. But let's just try and go through and kind of come up with some equations for this. Now, in particular, the first point or the first kind of common motif that we see here is that a lot of times we sort of partition this thing into two somewhat separate questions. The first question is basically, let's assume we had kind of a unit design for this amplifier. Where once we have the unit design and we know what the actual load is, we're just going to parallel copy units, those unit amplifiers to actually meet typically things like, for example, the bandwidth specifications. Okay? So the question then is, well, how do I go about designing the actual unit amplifier? Okay? Um, and here I'm just sort of walking through the different design equations that there are associated with that specific unit amplifier. So as an example, if we want to know kind of how much just parasitic capacitance is coming, oops, sorry is coming from the amplifier itself, meaning no explicit load, just the parasitic capacitance of the transistors, then at least with this very simplified example, you can just add up essentially all the drain parasitics as well as the gate to drain parasitics. If we then want to know what I'm going to call kind of like the intrinsic bandwidth, so this is essentially assuming there was no external capacitive load, what's the maximum bandwidth you could ever achieve from this amplifier, which is basically just set by the parallel you know, combination of the output resistance you know, obviously relative to the parasitic capacitance, the self-parasitic capacitance. The voltage gain obviously hopefully is, is kind of clear. It's just the GM times the RO, it's just written here in a way that you know, is accounting for the fact that I may have K of these unit amplifiers built up in parallel. Then if I want to know the actual bandwidth, then now it's obviously just the actual output resistance of K of them in parallel relative to how much load capacitance I have plus K of the parasitic capacitors all added up. And if you just do a little bit of algebra, you can then say, well, if I want to know how big, how many unit amplifiers I actually have to use, it really just turns out to be this ratio of the load capacitance to the parasitic capacitance of that unit. 
times 1 over essentially the intrinsic bandwidth divided by the actual bandwidth minus 1. Uh, for those of you who have sort of watched some of my lectures, you know that this kind of format of equation is something I'm very you know, fond of because it pops up all over the place. And it just tells you essentially that you know, if you want to build an amplifier that actually goes faster than the intrinsics of the transistors, sorry, it's not possible. And this actually tells you sort of how much extra power you have to pay to even get close to that. And so on the total, of course, you know, if I have k of these unit amplifiers, then you know, now I'm going to have just k times whatever the unit current is to actually for my overall power consumption. But you know, again, assuming that I've got this set of equations, you know, how do I determine what really is the best unit amplifier? Right? Because basically the k factor is kind of I can't really do too much about that once I have the unit amplifier. So the question is how do I make that i unit as small as I can? Well, so here's again actually where you know, Eric specifically did a, a decent amount of work to try and simplify this question, because this is a question that comes up quite often. And the basic idea is to say, all right, well, look, you know, I'm always going to be working with essentially a fairly small set of transistors or primitives in any one particular process technology. So why don't I just go and generate the layouts associated with the primitives that I already built, you know, these primitives that exist in an analog base, extract those, and then characterize them over a whole bunch of different, you know, bias voltages and process corners and temperatures and so on and so forth, right? And if I really do actual extractions from the real layout, then you know, I'm going to get back something that unfortunately is not just you know, your classic small signal transistor model, but it's going to have all kinds of other parasitics embedded inside of it. So the next step that Eric took was to say, OK, well, let me just take that, that sort of whatever model it is, essentially extract the Y parameters associated with that model, and then use those to say, OK, well, if I was going to fit this back to a simplified transistor model like I'm used to, what would be the effective numbers that I would get? So things like you know, the GDS, the CGS, the CGD, these are all now coming from actual post layout extraction of the transistor primitives that existed inside of, in this case, analog base, but could be in other quote unquote bases as well. So the point here is that you know, once you have this kind of quote unquote database that's being built up, now you're actually capturing the post layout effects at least at the transistor level, right? So anything that was kind of like the transistor and making those connections up to the vertical ports, that's all now being captured in this database. So now that I've got that, I can come up with actually a fairly simple design flow to how to really build that unit amplifier. So you know, say you're just given some specifications, uh, you know, just at, you know, as a first step, almost arbitrarily pick some transistor lengths and thresholds and widths. Um, just as really an acceleration thing, you know, you can go and run a real simulation, but since I have all this kind of characterization stuff in advance, I can basically just, you know, in this case for the NMOS and the PMOS, basically solve KCL to figure out, you know, what is the actual GMs when I'm at that bias point that VN is equal to V out, and then just look up all the small signal parameters from that database that I've got, where I've just got those first two boxes in the top right, and then just go and check, okay, for that particular design, do I meet the gain specification? If not, go back and pick something else. If I do, is it possible to meet the bandwidth specification? Again, if not, go back and pick something else. And if it is, all right, go and just compute how much power to actually spend for this particular design, right? And then what I do is I just look at, well, is this the best one I've gotten so far? If it is, I'll keep that. If not, you know, then basically I'll just keep going. And then I'll just check, are there anything, is there anything left for me to sweep over? By the way, to be clear, this is like, you know, there are some design equations in here, but this is like almost the thing that like I classically tell my students, you know, like you're just sweeping blindly, like don't do that. Well, it's a computer sweeping blindly, fine. If it's gonna find something that runs fast enough, you know, who am I to complain? So indeed, once you've gone through sort of and picked all these things, you just pick the best one, and you know, if there's nothing left, you're, you're, you're done. You've got your unit amplifier design. Now, the thing to point out here is that, as I said before, this is capturing all the parasitics up to those vertical ports in the primitive, right? In reality, for any actual circuit, there's gonna be additional routing that you have to do to really connect everything together. And that has not been captured yet. So obviously, we now need to go and do some additional iteration to make sure that we capture those effects and actually get back the specifications that we're interested in. And so the way we typically handle this is just to iterate on the actual top-level generator itself. And this is just another example of how to do that. So, you know, we, for example, take in the specifications, essentially compute all those circuit parameters with that database we had, like we said last time, go and actually generate the real schematics and layout, now using that generator that you saw before, extract it, simulate it, and then check. Did we meet our performance specs or not? If we did, great, we're done. If not, which of course is typically the answer, because again, we didn't take into account any of these sort of higher layer routing parasitics, then what you just go back and do is you say, okay, well, let's say I didn't meet my bandwidth by a factor of 10%. Let me just pretend that I'm actually shooting for a 10% higher bandwidth at the lower level. Essentially, recompute everything that I had done in this unit cell design by that extra 10%, and then just spin back through and check, okay, yeah, 
you know, if I upsize my target by 10%, given that I was off by 10% before, do I come back and now meet my specifications? And typically within, I'd say, maybe three, four iterations of doing this, you can kind of see how this typically converges, because, you know, as long as kind of, you know, over-specifying doesn't cause you to do sort of really wacky things, eventually the gap between what you expect your real performance is and what you get back from the real layout converges pretty quickly. So with that, I think I'll one more time hand it over actually to Eric so he can just show you kind of the, the actual script in practice. So Eric, okay. okay. <laughs> so I guess just to briefly go over the code. So, so in, in the back framework, the transistor database class is called MossDB discrete. So here I have defined various helper method. But basically you can see here, so here how to use this class, just a very quick overview. So, 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 you sh so before you use this database, you have to run simulation, which is done in another script. And as a result, it will generate the post extraction data. And you basically, and all those data is saved in some file somewhere. So in this particular example, we'll just be looking at the typical, typical corner uh, with the standard threshold devices. Then given that, you can create this MOS DB discrete class, and then you can simply call this query method, and then give it what kind of DBS, DBS, and VGS bias you want to query, and it'll return a list of a uh, small signal parameters associated with that bias point. In addition, uh, so what happens is that we have a multi-dimensional sweep over different values of VBS, VBS, and VGS when we characterize it. But then this class actually will help you interpolate between data points. So you, so you can, can get, so, so, so even for points you've never, never characterized before, you can, you can get some interpolated estimate, estimate of what those small signal parameters can be. In particular, In particular you can actually get the function associated with any uh, small signal parameters and plot it inside Python. So just as a quick example, I'm going to load this code. So here, unfortunately, the output window is pretty small, but this example just shows you that it's working properly, that for NMOS and PMOS, if you give it a VGS, VDS, and VDS, it'll tell you what the small signal parameters are at those bias points, like CDB, CDD, GM, GDS, I bias, so on and so forth. And, and this part just shows you how you can actually get one of the small signal parameter and either do a 3D block over various bias point or more traditional I bias versus VGS and VDS parametric curve as we can see in the two graphs here below. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then, so for, so the, for the inverter amplifier, amplifier design uh, that uh, e Elod just went through, here is the exact code implementation inside, inside Python. Python. So, so, so let me just run, run this. And, and so, so let so so basically the code is kind of going over similar to the flow chart he presented. So, 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 so above, above is helper, helper function, function, and here is the start of the actual design script. So in, so in the beginning, beginning user, user specifies some design parameter, like what is the load capacitance, what's the supply voltage, what's the target gain and bandwidth. Then we will get the transistor small signal parameter characterization database, and then we can get the current bias function, which we will use to solve the KCL equation. And in this, in this very simple example, uh, instead of sweeping over channel lengths, threshold, and width, I'm instead sweeping over the PN ratio. So I assume I have four fingers, of, so for my unit amplifier, I have four PMOS fingers, and I'm trying to figure out what's the optimal number of MOS fingers inside this for loop. So that is kind of our, like, our unit amplifier sweep. 
So basically, for each unit amplifier design, I first use a KCL to compute what's the what's the DC bias voltage. Since we know that the input voltage is has to be biased to be equal to the output voltage, and that can be easily done. That after after we know the bias condition, we can simply feed that into the transistor database, get the small signal parameters, and use the equation he presented to find the intrinsic bandwidth, the gain, and the parasitic capacitance of the unit amplifier. And then next step is where we go through that feasibility check in the flow chart. So if, if the gain of this unit amplifier is smaller than the target gain, then we know that no matter how many copies we try to add in parallel, we cannot improve the gain. And similarly, if the intrinsic bandwidth of this unit amplifier is smaller than the target bandwidth, then there's no way we can uh, improve the bandwidth by adding more units in parallel because the parasitic cap will increase faster than you're reducing the load capacitance. So once that's done, we know that this unit amplifier is feasible and again we can use that 1 over x minus 1 formula to calculate how many copies of the unit amplifier we need and what's the final total current. Then at this point, we just check if this current design is the most power efficient design we've seen so far. If it beats what we already have from previous iteration of the for loop, then we update the optimal amplifier design parameter. So then you can see that this for loop basically brute force through those PN ratio combination, and in the end, it prints out what's the optimal parameter. So again, the, out, the output of this uh, program is kind of small, so I copy and paste it into this window. So you can see that for this simple example, at when, when, the P, when PMOS is much larger than the MMOS, you have very low gain, uh, probably due to the smaller PM of the PMOS. So you can see in the beginning, it quickly... Sorry, is there a question? No, go ahead, Eric. Okay. Okay. So it quickly realized that this unit amplifier gain is too low, so it just jumped to the next design point. And now, after it found the optimal design, then it, you can see it's a finite for this, for P, for four finger PMOS, three finger MMOS, it needs 34 co copies and with a total current of roughly 4 million. And then, and then it updates as this is the first design. And just, and just it, it happens in this case that this is also the optimal design because as you see, later part in the for loop, it all pick up more bias current than the first design we found. And then in the end, it output the optimal result. Great. Yeah. So any questions on this part? Yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, yeah, congratulations, you're the first person to, to get this particular answer. I expect uh, you'll get this answer repeatedly, you know, for later questions. Whatever you yourself did, you know, when you designed it by hand, that's what you write in the code. The code will do no more, no less. <laughs> right, so yes, you know, however it is that you go about analyzing, you know, large signal slewing, uh, you know, distortion, linearity, so on and so forth, that's exactly what you write into this code right now. Obviously, for the sake of digestibility, we didn't attempt to, to show you something like that. Uh, but whatever it is that you do, that's what you have to put in there. Um, the, the thing that, that I guess is sort of interesting, the, 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 there's a related question that I often get, which is usually something along the lines of, oh, but like, I run some simulation and I like look at a waveform and I decide based on the waveform whether it's good or not, right? Um, and it's funny because oftentimes when people ask that question, they actually have sort of embedded the answer internally because they say, oh, I look at the waveform and I like kind of eyeball whether this is, you know, higher than that or, you know, so on. And they say, well, look, you just, you told me the algorithm. Just write that down, you know, on a sheet of paper and then translating the code usually is not the, the hard part. It's really just realizing what it is you were actually doing. Yeah. I'll go with you since you haven't asked the question before. <laughs> 
Yeah, great. So, so the question was, what if I don't know any equations whatsoever, but I know that if I run a simulation, based on the result of the simulation, I, I can kind of know which direction to move things. Um, as I said, I was, I was kind of joking around that, you know, the one over there had some equations in it, but was kind of the pseudo, you know, just iterate like crazy. Yes, if that worked for you and, you know, by hand it was giving you the results you wanted and it was fast enough, absolutely you can write a generator that does the exact same thing. Um, I, having said that, I would encourage you oftentimes, you know, like the most naive thing sometimes will just take a really, really long time for something very simple. And so sometimes kind of coming up with the right direct set of equations will really help you a lot. And in practice, I think where, where you typically end up with things like what you're describing is there's a lot of parameters that we actually end up kind of sizing when we do things by hand that are somewhat weaker knobs and there isn't really a very good kind of like answer for, oh yeah, it's clearly this or that. Right? That's exactly the kind of things where this kind of iteration makes a lot of sense because, you know, yeah, I can write some equation, but it's probably not really useful anyways because it's a detailed enough thing that I really need to run some detailed simulation. That's exactly the kind of thing where doing those kind of iterations makes a lot of sense. Yeah. yeah. So basically, I would set up a test where I want to simulate whatever I want. And based on that, I change things. Now, this changing is like, like sweeping, or is that some sort of optimization loop? Uh, you, you get you get uh, bonus number two, which is whatever you wanted to do by hand. That's uh, you know that's what you put in the code. So if you want to put it into some generic general purpose optimization framework, which Eric happens to like to do, great, you can throw it at that. If you prefer to just sweep in a big for loop, great, do that. Whatever it is that worked for you, that's what you should write in the code, no more, no less. Um, there's no, so the question was, is there optimization stuff kind of explicitly built in? I, I think the short answer is no, but there's nothing, you know, there's no like optimization engine specifically written into bag. Having said that, uh, Python has plenty of optimization packages out there that you can grab and is exactly what we do. Yeah. I think you had a question. So, um, yeah, I think it's related to this question. So, I think this is more like a symbolic way of optimizing the circuit, right? And this is like mediate really try like a, it's, it's trying to deny it, right? Like, in, uh, like uh, and it actually turns out it, it works for simple circuits, but once it's becoming complicated, it doesn't really work. Um, and then in the, in the, in the, in the 2000, like, around, people can start to use equation-based, uh, like, uh, like, doing equations, because it's very hard, actually, to use simple equations to describe. Uh, so I guess why, uh, like, did you try something like that, like putting simulation in the loop and yeah, more, so, more advanced, like, uh, so it's a long question. I'm going to try and rephrase it a little bit and then give the answer. So the, the way I would sort of paraphrase your question was, there's been a lot of different approaches people have tried in the EDA community to essentially do the circuit sizing problem, right? From brute force simulation to equation based to some mix between them and so on and so forth. Um, so the short answer is, again, I, there is absolutely nothing built into bag that tells you which way to do it. So whichever way you found is successful for you, that's what you should write into the program. And so in fact, this particular example we showed you is some blend between simulation, between equation-based and simulation-based, um, because once we have a unit amplifier, we use the equations to actually do the sort of the, the like multiplicative, multiplicative sizing, but to actually find the unit amplifier, that's where there's these sweeps that are happening, right? So again, the answer is whatever you found that works for you, that's what you should write into, the, into this, you know, and, and if that works by hand, it'll work in the code. If it doesn't work by hand, it also will not work in the code. Yeah. Oh, so do you assume that for people to actually write this code and be successful, the only thing you need to know is that you're not. Ah, great question. So they will fail for sure. Correct. So, so the question was, you know, if you want to write this code and be successful, you better understand what you're doing. You know, yes, that you know, I there is, and this is why I said back in the beginning, right? I am not promising you automation. I am promising you reuse, right? And so if you know how, you know, if you know how to do the circuit, you know what the optimal methodology is, you'll be able to write the code. If you don't know your methodology, I'm gonna argue the issue is not the generator approach, it's just that you don't know what it is that you were doing, and so once you figure that out, that's where the generator thing will help. So, so you not only need to know the circuit very well, and if some simulation That's correct. You, you, you need to know your methodology. That's absolutely correct. Can you explain the benefits of doing this compared to an experienced designer actually doing this uh, So the question was, what's the benefit of doing this compared to the experienced designer going about and doing that? 
It's that, remember, every time you've done it, any change that somebody wants to make, right, if you actually have it in the generator now, you push a button and you change it in the generator. You don't have the designer involved. Okay, so to give you a couple of very simple examples, um, this is all coming from UC Berkeley. Um, Eric has not yet failed to make dramatic changes in his circuits two days before the takeout. Okay? So why do I mention this? Because I think many of you will, will resonate with the example of you're going, you're building, I'll just make it up, some wireless receiver, and you know, again, like two days before the tape out, somebody comes back and says, oh my god, the standard just got changed, there's this new interference scenario that we never thought of, and darn it, we need like an extra bit or two in our ADC, right? And so usually you say, well, that's nice, but now I have to go like rip up my entire design, re-simulate all the drivers and buffers in front of it, you know, make space in the layout to actually get this thing to fit, rerun everything. If you've got a generator, that's exactly what the generator will do for you, right? So you say, all right, I want an extra bit. Push the button, go, it'll do what your designer would have done, give you back the new design, check the same way the designer would have done. And believe me, you know, the things that are captured in code run much, much faster than the human actually going and jogging around memory does. Okay, so can you say the main benefit is if the experienced designer summarizes everything in EAG and somebody else less experienced can just use that and get something to work? Uh, so, so the question was, is the main benefit basically that you get sort of your, your expert designer to capture things this way and then sort of hand it over to the less experienced person? To zero order, yes, but that's kind of, oh, you don't see it anymore. Uh, Eric, I'm going to steal your screen for a moment. That's kind of what I was getting at with, you know, sort of this slide here, right? So you're absolutely right that when you're writing a generator, it's a force multiplier on the expert. Because if you don't know what you're doing, you know, the, the generator also will suck, right? And I don't mean you, you know, in general, if one does not know, right, the, the generator will not work very well, right? So yes, it's, it's a force multiplier on the expert because now you get the expert, but it's the expert as a computer with varying parameters, A. B, if you do it right, process portable. And C, and again, this is actually a pretty important one, you know, again, let's say there's some feature you need to go and add in. It's not that the designer has to go back and think of all of the things I ever did you know, to try and make this thing work. You go back and you look at the code and you incrementally extend the code to add that feature in. But yeah, uh, I, I would by no means claim that like, you know, somebody who absolutely doesn't know anything about what they're doing should be writing a generator. Because yes, the generator they create will not be particularly usable. Or I should say at least not optimal. <laughs> Ah. Yeah, so the question was, can the, can the framework be used to actually sweep the floor plan? Absolutely. Um, we haven't done that too typically, um, only because, in my experience at least, a lot of times what you end up doing is, is you sort of just, you kind of floor plan the analog mix signal part fairly carefully to try and sort of be consistent internally. And then all of the sort of confirmations that happen from that, you typically throw at the digital place and route side because it's, you know, that's the more generic tool. But having said that, yes, absolutely. You could certainly do something like, well, I want the, you know, sort of long and, you know, the long and short one or, the, you know, tall and wide. Like, you can absolutely write different layout generators for each one of them and then iterate through and pick whichever one is best. That certainly is doable. Yeah, no, absolutely. So certainly those are things you can do. As I said, we haven't played around too much with that specific direction, only because we tend to kind of have a fairly specific floor plan in mind. But absolutely, there's no reason you can't do it. In fact, well, I won't do this. So I was going to say, Eric could probably code that up, you know, like now as we speak. <laughs> but, but yes, absolutely, those are things you could do. As long as, again, you're being sort of this abstraction of, okay, you know, where are the transistor rows, how do I want them connected, and so on and so forth. Yep, absolutely. So the question was, you know, can I, can I do something that's like, you know, more of a centralized bus or some like tree topology? Anything that basically you can draw yourself on a grid, you should be able to do it back as well. And so the trick there is, which, which you kind of hint at, but it's written in one of the boot camps. Um, you know, the first thing you should always do is draw the floor plan. Because if you don't know the floor plan, you know, writing code is kind of hopeless, right? 
And then you should draw the foreground and say, okay, well, like, here's the transistor rows, here's how many tracks it needs, or if you, know, you want the tree versus bus routing, here's like, which track I use for what. Um, as you were also hinting at, you can certainly do things like, well, do I do this connection on you know, metal six versus metal eight versus metal 10, right? All of those things, as long as you programmatically can explain how you made the decision and you know, what to do, absolutely, you can write the code to do it too. Yeah, of course. Yep. So if you're going to come up with a new creative innovative topology, you don't do this until after you've done it once. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. Um, so the question was, you know, it, it, because this is all about reuse, you know, if you're going to come up and, you know, do the, the new creative innovative topology, do you do it this way or, you know, do you go back to the old way? Um, and, and you stated you probably just do it the old, you know, way and then figure out what you're really doing. To zero order, I, I kind of agree and I kind of don't. Um, and the reason I say that is the following. Um, basically, if you kind of start already thinking this way from the get-go and you start saying, okay, look, yeah, I've got this new thing and like, I want to kind of play around with stuff, what I think you actually start doing is kind of writing pieces of the generator as you go, right? Because there's probably a lot of stuff you do know very well and there's pieces you're not as sure about. So I think you really write the pieces that you know and even the ones you don't, you can just write it as, you know, the Python code might be W equals two, right? Because you don't really know the right answer yet. But then it gives you kind of the right structure and it makes it very clear for yourself, well look, methodologically, what are the gaps, what are the things that I still really need to figure out? So that even at the end of the day, like you might get one particular design, it might not be a full generator, but it gives you something where the stuff you really did understand now has a structure and framework to it. Well, the you can say, well, I, I knew it, I need a current mirror, I'm going to add another current mirror, I'm going to see if you can That's right, exactly, yeah. And, and there is a lot of these things where it's, you know, as you said, there's just... Uh, stuff around that you might have generators for already, certainly there's no reason to, to kind of go back and re-engineer that, unless there's a specific interactions you haven't thought of before that, you know, even there, I would argue the best way to handle that would be to go and then improve that other components, you know, thing to understand that interaction and be able to deal with it rather than, you know, starting from scratch. That's a great question. Yeah? Uh, yeah. So, in your example, you made many ICs. At what point have you gone manual? Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's... it's, it's it's a great question. Um, so the question was, you know, at what point have we typically switched over to just start doing things manually? Um, that's varied. Um, you know, so every, every kind of picture has slightly different. But having said that, a, a lot of times people have gone, people have stayed in this framework, you know, higher than I was expecting initially. Um, you know, so in fact, let me try and get back to those, some of those pictures. Um, yeah, so this is the right slide, I think. Um, yeah, so, well, actually that one. Those two. So, for example, that photonic receiver AFE, if you remember, I told you bump pitch was actually a parameter. So, that one was actually all the way up at the top level, right? Um, for the full service receiver, um, basically, <laughs> once we got up to a certain point, there was, enough, there was a small enough number of things, and the tape out deadline was close enough that we just you know, pulled the trigger and got that done that way. Um, but actually, you know, students at Berkeley are continuing to work on this, and I think they're pretty much at the top level now. Um, and a lot of that just has to do with, you know, I guess I would say this, like, yeah, like, because you sort of have the control to do the things that you want to do, right, the top level becomes a lot less painful, at least in terms of the very specific analog stuff you care about, right? And then even for, like, digital bus wires and things, like, if you're not trying to optimize every last little bit of area out of it, but you have very specific tracks and everything that you're trying to deal with in any case because you don't want to interfere with the analog, this is one of these things where I was expecting students to just like start, you know, throwing at a generic, generic place and route systems. Um, but somewhat surprisingly to me, what I found is they just started writing it in bag because it was easy enough and it was constrained enough and it just sort of did what they wanted quickly enough. Whereas, you know, to really get into the generic place and route system, that's where you had to start writing all these extra constraints that they just decide and forget it. It's not worth it. Now, this is not to say we're replacing place and route, right? Like, it's a very specific problem you're trying to solve, and you know, if you're trying to do things in that way, we found that this actually works pretty nicely, kind of even all the way up to the top level. Um, none of the, you know, I'm not dogmatic about any of these things, right? Like, obviously, at the end of the day, you do what's really practical. Um, and I think, in general, you always, you know, you start with the stuff you understand, the stuff that's easy to do, you start reusing that, you see where the pain points are, and you, you iterate from there. Of course. Yep. Ah, okay, great question. So the question was, every time you start with a new process, you have to set something up. In particular, you have to go and set up these primitives that are implementing these abstractions that we're talking about, right? Um, 
So that really depends obviously on the process, depends on the complexity of that, depends on whether or not there's an easy way to match this abstraction that we've created. Um, but to give you sort of, let's say, anecdotal data, uh, for Eric in particular, this usually takes about two weeks or so. Now, Eric knows this stuff really well. He created the framework. He knows exactly what to do. I would not argue that that's a you know, general thing everyone should plan for. But for people who really sort of know and understand this approach, that hasn't been sort of a substantial time sink yet. Um, there are not many people right now who really know how to do that, <laughs> to be clear. Um, but in general, that hasn't been a, a huge time sink. Correct. So right now, we don't have an automated way of, of figuring out what those primitives are, uh, just from reading in the DRC rules. And you know that would be a really cool thing to do. But in practice, I think may you know I think the development time of doing that may be much more than just at least what it's cost us to develop the primitives so far. So that's why we haven't sort of attempted to pull that trigger. Yeah. Okay. So now you've done this at Berkeley, and there's a lot of these students who kind of go through design in some ways the first time. Yeah, so the, the question was, which I'll, I'll, I'll choose a couple of your words and then I'll insert a, a couple of my own. Um, the question was, well, you know, so we've had a lot of experience doing this at Berkeley with, you know, young students that, you know, programming is kind of, you know, the, the, the water that they swim in is fish or whatever. You know, have we had an experience kind of getting the old, quote unquote, crusty designers to, to do this? Um, so from that standpoint, it depends a lot on how crusty the designer is <laughs> in the sense of how, let's say, it, it's, it's really two things. Um, one is the question about, you know, are people averse to programming or not, right? And that's usually the first one that people kind of have the gut reaction to. Um, and in all honesty, I think that's really not the fundamental barrier. Because uh, if it's really a question of, I know what it is that I'm doing and I just need to write code that does it, and this is where I'll put on explicitly the Berkeley hat, you know, go hire a Berkeley undergrad, that particular problem of just writing the code, that's imminently solvable. Um, and you saw the code, right? There's nothing sophisticated, object-oriented, you know, like there's nothing crazy happening there, right? Um, the bigger issue in my experience really has much more to do with what we talked about before, which is getting people to actually sit down and say, this is what I actually did, right? Programmatically, this is really what I did and how I did it and how I made my decisions, right? That's where, and again, this is not like a, a complaint or any, like even for me, right? Like there's a lot of things I would do by hand that I didn't realize that, okay, algorithmically, this is what I'm really doing. And so that's where I think people have a bit more of a mindset adjustment they have to go through of just, yeah, like, I can now say, even on pencil and paper or as a block diagram, this is what the algorithm is supposed to, to work, you know, look like. Yeah. So I guess I didn't exactly answer your question. Um, we're starting down that path, uh, you know, and again, it depends a lot on who the designer is and, you know, how, how they think about stuff to begin with. Great, yes, I think we're out of time. Thank you all very much for your attention. Thanks, Eric. <laughs>
all, everything you're saying is true. Yes, there are many, many parameters. But when you take the experience designer, they say, look, here are the things that I really care about. Here's the things that I really need to optimize for. And here's the stuff that, you know what? As long as I get it about right, or I meet the constraint, I'm good to go. Right now, this is not to say that all possible circuits one can ever come up with somebody knows the answer to right now. But this is kind of the same discussion we were having before about if your challenge is, I don't know how to codify my design methodology, then that makes perfect sense, but that means that's exactly where you need to focus, meaning what is the actual methodology? Once you have a methodology, that's when you can put into the generator. And if you don't have a methodology, yes, I, I can help you. Does that make sense? Um, yeah, I guess I'm talking about different, different complexity, not like putting things like all together, but rather it's the complexity of... Yeah, no, no, I, I understand, and that's what I was getting at, I think. I think it all just comes back to how well do you yourself understand the optimization process you're going through for that particular type of block. And absolutely, if, if you can't sort of put into words what that process is, then yeah, you know, you won't be able to write a generator either, and I'm, I can't help with that. At least from the standpoint of building a generator framework. You know, we can sit down and talk about the circuit, but that's a different story. Maybe we can finish the discussion yeah. because we're yes. to be back here at 3 o'clock, so let's thank Professor Thank you.